Welcome to this presentation on a joint research project about volumetric mapping for long-term robot interaction. So what are we trying to achieve in this project? The high level goal is to enable robots to act intelligently in environments that are shared with uh, other agents and over longer periods of time. So in particular for application cases such as um, service robotics, or for example, we have a robot at home where you also have uh, other humans changing things. Um, change environment is inevitable and it's crucial component for robots to be able to understand and capture these changes. This holds for essentially all sorts of robots and also for virtual interactions such as with uh, augmented reality devices, in particular for uh, human robot interaction tasks. <clears throat> so what are the requirements that you would have for such a kind of system? On the one hand side, since you want to do interaction, it needs to be able to accurately capture the geometry and the shape of the surrounding um, of the agent. And this is relevant for tasks such as uh, collision avoidance, if you want to do a physical or virtual uh, manipulation tasks, such as touching or grasping. And of course, we would also want to have a representation of free space to be able to use it for planning. A second crucial component for the intelligent part is to have some sort of a scene understanding for higher level tasks and planning. And last but not least, where the focus of this work lies on a bit most, we want our map to be consistent, both in terms of the spatial and the temporal domain. So in spatial consistency, we are usually talking about state estimation errors. But in particular, as already mentioned, the fact that environments are shared, things are going to change, which we call a long-term scene changes. So to focus a bit more on this component, there's been a lot of interest recently towards this direction to incorporate these sort of changes. With um, <clears throat> on the one end of the spectrum, we have what I call short-term dynamics, so things that are currently being moved in your current um, sensor view, but these approaches usually only work well in a very confined environments with very few objects. And on the other end of the spectrum, we do have uh, the change detection paradigm where post hoc after processing all the data, we evaluate what are things that have changed and which are the conclusions we can draw about the environment. But of course, we would want something in between where the robot can act actively incorporate these changes to perform interaction tasks. So why is this such a hard problem? Whenever we are talking about change, um, at the root of it, there is this measurement versus map disagreement. And the point is this disagreement can come for a large variety of sources. You might have um, sense or uncertainties or errors. Another option is that maybe your sensing data is correct, but your map belief is um, out of date. And last but not least, there's all sorts of processing errors, such as a uh, state estimation uncertainty and uh, other issues. And to figure out from the disagreement, which um, of these many cases is um, happening, is um, not easy to disentangle. And also how should we integrate the data depends very much on what we think is the reason for it being different. And particularly sort of an open question of how to integrate this to keep on the one hand side your map always up to date that you can work with the current environment, but simultaneously you don't want to discard all your previous information, for example, to um, average out sensing noise. And unfortunately, even if we stick to only the most recent measurements, you might still end up in configurations where your map is uh, inconsistent with itself, with the measurements that you are making. So the goal of uh, this project or this part of the work is to find a map representation that ticks all our boxes, that contains the volumetric surface information, that contains semantic scene understanding. Ideally, it should be <coughs> able to run efficiently online a compute constraint device, such as a mobile robot or a augmented reality device. And the focus of, of this part on the work lies as mentioned on this temporal consistency. So to give a bit of a motivation and an example case, for example, here we see uh, this simulated environment that is being mapped uh, at one point in time. And we also have a snapshot at a later point in time. And um, these are sort of the shell the kind of changes we would expect in such an environment, right? So maybe here's a new coffee machine added, some objects might have been gone, and other parts were maybe moved to highlight a few here. Maybe somebody sat on the chair, has been rotated. And on the right, we see the complete map that integrates all the data from both observations. And we notice that there's a number of artifacts that we would not want to have 
which are very common with state-of-the-art volumetric mapping frameworks. For example, here is a picture is being duplicated, but we know that it should be only one at the end of the day. Similarly, the coffee machine that used to be free space um, cannot be captured as accurately as in a standalone observation. And I don't know whether this representation will be very useful for interaction. And then last but not least, if you look here, for example, on the chair that was rotated, if we want to keep the previous information and just merge them together, we end up with this potato shape, which is, of course, not desirable. So how do we go about this problem? We took some inspiration on uh, how do humans do this, because we are actually very good at managing these sort of um, temporal changes. And uh, from my understanding of the most recent findings in neurology, we are highly likely to perform a lot of abstractions and see the world sort of as a collection of objects, which makes a lot of sense since it's a lot easier to reason about a few objects than a dense surface, so to speak. <clears throat> and also, of course, this makes a lot um, of sense based on the observation that the physical world typically does not change at random. So if you make observations, it's not voxel here, there, and over here flipping, but in a semantically consistent way, meaning that the entire objects, such as a chair or a rigid parts thereof, are moved or removed. And this is essentially the foundation for our approach, where the idea is, uh, can we also in a robotic context represent the world as a collection of objects? And for the question, what are objects, we go to the domain of panoptic segmentation, <clears throat> where with panoptic, we do differentiate between instances, like things in our environment, such as these two chairs. But on the other hand, um, to get this full representation of the environment, we of course also care about the background, such as floors or walls. And last but not least, we also want to incorporate the free space as a sort of third layer that you then can recover the fully volumetric map. And uh, in terms of approach, we employ a summit-based approach as has worked well, for example, the spatial consistency problem with volumetric maps. But here the idea is that we reconstruct each and every object individually in its own submap. <clears throat> and then from this collection of objects, recover the full volumetric information. So how does this work in practice? The idea is that we allocate submaps based on these panoptic detections of objects that we have here. On the right, we can see uh, the map being built. And then in order to get an uh, accurate and proper construction, we need to integrate all measurements into all submaps simultaneously in a specific way. But it turns out there are ways to do this um, efficiently. So on the one hand side, we can run this for this demo scenario with the presented resolution and about um, 70 objects in 15 hertz on a laptop CPU. And also we can arrange this hierarchically to make the scaling predominantly governed by the environment complexity, meaning the number of objects. We could also extend this approach to large scale environments. And another very neat property of this approach is that it's inherently multi-resolution because each object is reconstructed individually, which we can see here that, for example, the table is reconstructed more accurately than the floor, and that these points, which represent the free space, are a lot more coarse because usually it's sufficient information. There's also a number of other advantages to this approach because we can use our semantic understanding of the scene also for the reconstruction. So for example, we don't accidentally merge things together that we know this is a table and this is a wall, should not be merged. Simultaneously, we can use this information to disentangle our uh, measurement disagreement problem and figure out, okay, the chair has changed, so we do not merge it into a potato. And also due to the multi-resolution, we are able to capture, for example, thin structures or small objects like the chair, the legs of the chair, which are missing here at a uniform resolution. And to dive a bit more into this multi-resolution problem, we can here see the environment reconstructed at the increasing resolution with a fixed resolution size. So we see that the map resolution is very crucial, but for different parts of the object here, for example, uh, where there's very small objects and minute details in the geometry, high resolution introduces a very high error. But because it's a volumetric problem, once we decrease the resolution, we very quickly get extremely um, large memory usage for our map. On the other hand, if we have this uh, multi-resolution 
AMP Panoptic Multi GSDF map, we can see that the overall reconstruction or <clears throat> error, which is primarily governed by, say, the large surfaces, can be um, lower than for certain fixed resolution uh, approaches while using a lot less memory. And that the most important part about this is that we get the resolution where we really want it. For example, here um, on the table, we can see even with a comparably high um, resolution, the small objects are still not captured properly. Whereas here we can reconstruct them in more detail, which will be more useful for uh, interactions or animation tasks. Then the other part why we want to do this is we can use it <coughs> in order to make out these temporal differences. So what we here see is in shaded our previous observations and in solid um, our current observations of the robot. And due to this semantic understanding, we are able to disentangle which parts of the environment have changed. For example, in blue, we see observations that geometrically and semantically um, agree and are in alignment with our previous observations. So we can expect reasonably certain that, for example, these shaded blue things will still be in place, even though we have not yet observed them. But on the other, we are able to figure out, OK, this chair has moved. So we discard the old chair in red and use only the most latent or the most recent measurements to reconstruct it. And the large advantage of this is that we get this semantic consistency, for example, only here, where um, a small corner of the this bed was observed. We immediately noticed that the old bed can no longer be there, and the entire bed is removed from our map. So we won't have, uh, for example, half the bed lingering around there and can be directly used for planning purposes. And to continue with the planning, <clears throat> of course, it is very important that we can do efficient lookups. And it turns out there's also some tricks for that with a hierarchical map structure and lookup structure, we can perform lookups quite quickly in the terms of a few microseconds. And uh, here we see one layer for visualization. So it's a uh, one slice is a fixed height that uh, predicts us or measures whether space is um, free in blue or occupied in red, a very standard map presentation for robotic collision checking. We can see we can get this at the different resolutions. For example, we have here occupied for the thin legs of the table, which would have not be captured, for example, with a fixed resolution TSDF. There, the scale factor is too low for the legs. But most importantly, we have this temporal component in the map. So directly from one map representation, we can see in um, shaded what are our expectations about the map, what is our previous knowledge, but also in solid, what have we observed currently, which can be used for safe planning. So to summarize what I briefly presented, and um, we have explored an object-centric submap-based approach, and we showed this can be a highly salient map presentation for volumetric maps. In particular, this can be built and queried very efficiently on a laptop CPU only, if you have a for example, good semantic predictions. It is an inherently multi-resolution, which can be very useful for more accurate and more memory efficient reconstruction purposes. But most importantly, we can try to disentangle this problem of where do our map measurement disagreements stem from in order to process each measurement correctly and get an up-to-date map that reuses as much of the information as possible. And last but not least, we have by construction this semantic consistency. So you will never see half a table floating around in your map because it's not very plausible. And the entire table would be removed. So where do we go next from here? On the more short-term scale, we are working on making this run with um, real robots. So here we see a data set using a real depth sensor. Uh, employed in our pipeline, and we can see that it still works very neatly. We still get agreement between previous and uh, actual observations and can figure out which things have changed, even including all the real um, sensing noise, such as um, occlusions and the uh, depth uncertainty, and it seems to work quite well. What we are also still working on <clears throat> is to make the approach run more robustly with a uh, actual panoptic segmentation. So here we can see some predictions which are quite good in some places, not as good in other places. 
But um, in order to create this multi-resolution submap representation from it, we're still working uh, on improved robustness to make then all our features also work with a real system. On a bit more long-term scale, <coughs> Um, our approach is very suitable to be added to some graph backbone. This could be, for example, a 3D scene graph structure that on the one hand side enables more spatial consistency with our map, but also a higher level understanding and abstractions for high level understanding and planning tasks. And the other projects we're working on include if we are able to re-localize objects that have moved instead of just discarding them we can reuse even more of our previous observation improve map quality over time and are eventually maybe also able to do some uh, temporal reasoning and then with this short outlook i would like to conclude the presentation and i'm happy to answer any questions on the live stream